minute or so. I'm just going to let folks uh, come back in from the break. So if you uh, hear me out there, if you could make your way back in. We've got a very special guest for our next session that I will introduce in just a moment. All right, take your seats. We'll get started here. So it's um, with great pleasure that uh, our next guest is with us this morning. Uh, we were very excited uh, when we added him to the agenda, and I'm sure he's going to have some great uh, insights to share with all of you. So um, Dr. David Danielson is the Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy with the uh, Department of Energy. And uh, prior to that, uh, he was Program Director for ARPA-E, and uh, also in, some, in the venture capital world uh, with General Catalyst, who has a number of investments uh, in this space. So with that, um, I'm going to let uh, David uh, take the stage and uh, provide you with a, with a few thoughts, and then we'll open it up for some Q&A. So welcome, David. All right, good morning. Good, morning. good morning. Well, Rick, I want to congratulate you. I think it was six, seven years ago, we were sitting around a coffee shop when you guys were just getting this thing up and running. And I think you've been, uh, GTM has been incredibly successful, actually. I don't know if I, as a government official, I'm probably not allowed to endorse, but I read it every day. Um, so I wanted to really just uh, kind of tee up a few things from a government perspective. You know, first, I want to make it very clear. I am from the government, and I am here to help. Um, yeah, th thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to tee up where I see DOE's interest in the grid edge, grid modernization space. Uh, a pretty, talk to you a little about a pretty significant shift we've had over the last two or three years. I arrived uh, at DOE, uh, at EERE, my office, about three years ago. Uh, and then talk to you about what I see as the path forward uh, for us, and really invite you into a, a dialogue and a conversation for how best the DOE can work with this community going forward. And you know, having come from the private sector myself, I know it's really the private sector that's going to drive a lot of this. I also have a clear understanding that you know, it's state regulatory bodies have a really huge role to play in this space. And so you know, at DOE, I think we're humble about the role we have to play, but we think we may have some important roles to play. And we'd love to, uh, to be your partner in, in this space. Uh, so from a top level perspective, you know, in this administration, you know, what, what is our equity here? You know, it really, I think, comes down to our interest in seeing a clean, uh, affordable, reliable, and secure grid going forward. And it's really driven by President Obama's commitment uh, that he's made uh, actually just a few months ago for the United States to reduce its GHG emissions by 26 to 28% by 2025 uh, versus 2005 levels. You know, just to remind you that going from uh, 2005 to, to 2020 and then 2020 to 2025, it, we're actually going to be having to double the rate at which we're reducing our GHG emissions. And so we're going to have to really step up our game. And we're going to have to make sure we have solutions tested and demonstrated at scale uh, in the 2020 time frame if we're going to get to these kind of numbers in the 2020 2025 time frame. Also, as we all know, the Clean Power Plan, the draft rule out there, 30% reduction uh, in CO2 from the power sector by 2030, major driver. Um, and also we're seeing a lot of state leadership, California, New York, and elsewhere, uh, really driving in interesting directions. And so I think with the exciting trends that we've all talked about all day, I'm sure, you know, the, the significant drop in the cost of renewables, the rise of DER and intelligent efficiency in bringing in storage and IT and comms technology into the energy sector and the grid, and the broader, uh, I think, and more specific visibility and control opportunities that we're seeing on the grid, we, we, uh, I think we see a huge opportunity. And I think where we are today is that we have a pretty affordable, pretty uh, reliable grid, but not a clean grid. And where we want to go is, is get, not only get a clean grid, but do it in a way that maintains or enhances our reliability and the affordability. And so uh, from a DOE perspective, we see a very kind of well-defined set of roles that we want to play in this area and that we have been playing. One is in our kind of core bread and butter research, development, and, and small-scale demonstration of advanced technologies and, and new approaches to really drive innovation at the grid edge. Uh, secondly, we are looking to really enhance, we have some activity here, we really want to enhance this going forward 
establish much stronger and more robust regional partnerships with the stakeholders out there, with utilities, the regulatory folks, the innovative equipment and service providers, come together with you to, to apply our resources to your most important problems. Uh, third, we're really interested, and I'll talk more about this going forward uh, over the next few years, investing in integrated demos at scale uh, at the grid edge to show what's possible. And then finally, I think an underappreciated role, but a role that I think is really important, especially as I've had some kind of a behind closed doors, um, you know, uh, Chatham House rules conversations with a lot of different stakeholders, that the water's a little murky in the grid edge. And uh, I really think that DOE can play a role in convening analysis, being an honest broker, and, and really kind of providing some framing for what are the paths forward. The paths forward are gonna be different in different regions, but I think that's an area where we really wanna make a significant contribution. Uh, and at DOE, we've actually had a major uh, shift in the last few years. Um, I would say, if you go, I started in 2012 at ERE, and before that, you know, there was this laser focus on widgets. How do I make the widget more cost effective? How do I get the performance? How do I get a solar module cheaper? And virtually no thinking around the grid and the system. And so I, when, I, when I arrived, I think we had very little uh, effort looking at actual uh, grid integration. I think we were investing in some integration studies, some advanced components and power electronics area, but very little investment in that area. And then as I arrived, I think we all, it was when these technologies like solar and wind and other things really got, are getting to the point where it's clear that they're, they're going to be cost competitive in the near future. The volumes are growing. It's becoming a real, the, the system level issues are becoming very real as we all know. Uh, we've really pivoted uh, my office and, and all of DOE in a significant way, but it really started from the bottom up where over the last two or three years, we've probably tripled the amount of investment that we're putting in this area. Uh, you may be shocked to know that in 2012, uh, our building technologies office didn't do anything on grid integration. Uh, you know, our solar and wind program, we're doing a little bit, but uh, over the last two or three years, we've gotten our buildings uh, program involved, our EV program involved, fuel cells across the board. Now we've really seen a significant bottom-up uh, you know, set of activity coming, coming out of the Department of Energy. Um, and so we've seen exciting things like uh, advanced, as I mentioned, uh, the Western Wind and Solar Integration Study, which really provide, you know, use advanced modeling simulation to show that we can get 30% plus uh, wind and solar penetrations on the grid and it'll work. So I know that stakeholders have been able to use those kind of studies to, uh, to go to regulators and, and show that, that uh, we can get to these kind of levels of penetration. We've been doing those kind of things. As I said, we've been investing in advanced power electronics that are able to provide uh, grid services like Voltmar, Ride Through, and other things. Uh, we've been investing in solar and wind forecasting to allow solar and wind to be much more predictable uh, and a much more valuable asset for the grids. We've invested in an interesting program called GEARED, which is a $25 million five year program where we're investing in four major partnerships around the country uh, that are really focusing on educating the next generation of kind of graduate level engineers to be able to do the power systems of the future that are gonna be distributed power systems. So we've got partnerships all around the country in that area. Uh, and we're also um, in the process, uh, just in a few weeks, we're gonna be announcing the winners of our Shines funding opportunity, which is a $15 million funding opportunity that's gonna to go to companies out there that are really pushing the envelope on integrating solar and storage. And so we've, I'd say we've started to build over the last two or three years some real muscle. Uh, some real, you know, we're actually developing some programs, we're making some significant investments alongside our sister office, the Office of Electricity at DOE, which is traditionally focused more on transmission and distribution, whereas we focused more on behind the meter. We're starting to, to blur the lines there a little bit, which I think is a very good thing. Um, and then a couple areas where we're also investing in significantly in uh, power electronics. We have $140 million five-year investment in an Power America, which is a major manufacturing innovation institute trying to drive the cost of wide band gap power electronics down, investing in grid storage and, and uh, in those technologies as well. Uh, but a couple areas I, I think are where we're making particularly, particularly exciting progress um, and want to make you aware of them, want to make sure that, that we're, we're able to partner is in the area. One is in the area where our buildings program, again, just over the last two or three years got in the game. And they've been investing in, uh, in open source uh, control and coordination platform that really is meant to enable developers to quickly uh, build secure apps and agents to really unlock grid services in the transactive energy space. And this is a platform called Voltron. We're, we're actually starting to get a lot of commercial traction with a number of big companies. Uh, and this is an area where I'd like to engage with you more going forward. I'll talk about the opportunity to do that. 
And then also uh, one of the major, uh, actually NREL, our national labs, had some major foresight. And in 2007, well, we started building, even before I arrived, five years before I arrived, uh, and before most folks at DOE were thinking much about the grid edge, they had the foresight to, uh, to get the funding to invest $135 million from, from uh, EERE, from DOE, into the Energy Systems Integration Facility, which is a world-class new facility that just got up and running about a year and a half ago at NREL that, is, that has, uh, the, for the first time ever, megawatt-scale hardware-in-the-loop testing capability, in addition to the, the largest and most powerful high-performance computer on Earth that's dedicated specifically to clean energy uh, and advanced grid issues. And so um, one of the great success stories we've had there just in the last uh, few months is, as uh, many of you know, you know Hawaiian Electric uh, had reached a point where they had penetration levels of PV on rooftops where they were no longer comfortable uh, interconnecting any more PV. We were able to work with Solar City uh, and the, the National Renewable Energy Lab, this ESIF facility in my office, to actually do the, the testing, the, the, the hardware in the loop testing, to show that advanced inverters could provide the kind of services to enable much higher penetrations of rooftop solar, double the penetration that they were willing to do uh, before we did these studies. And so uh, with, the, with those results, HECO actually went and raised the cap by a factor of two and was able to get thousands of new systems on board. So I think that's the kind of capability this energy systems integration facility in our national lab, labs have and the kind of capability I'd like you to be able to tap into. Uh, what Just over the last year or so, I think we've taken this kind of bottom-up you know, muscle building or you know, tools building a work that's been done and given it a top-down view. So we, we are we're notorious at DOE for our wonderful silos. I think they call them silos of excellence. Uh, and so we really started working hard to, to break those down over the last year or so. And I think our investment at NREL in the Energy Systems Integration Facility was a great start. Uh, and then for the first time last year, we invested about $7 million from my office uh, where we got rid of the color of money from which office, whether it's solar or wind or, or vehicles or other offices, and we actually started investing in partnerships at NREL where they're blurring the lines across all of these applications and just starting to look at things like end-to-end -end interoperability, uh, transactive energy across, uh, across multiple devices, uh, beginning to scratch the surface of really characterizing the, the services that, and, and really documenting the services that, that new devices can provide. And so we're just getting in the game there. We funded projects with EPRI and utilities, NRG Energy, Siemens, and others. Uh, five projects, I think, that are really pioneering the way for how we need to work going forward. And so um, before I really strongly do believe that DOE were punching way below our weight because we were operating in our silos, uh, but as, by my view, it's not enough for my office, ERE, to break down the silos. We've got to break down all the silos at DOE. And there was actually an opportune moment over the last uh, just year or so. Another major priority of Secretary Moniz is something called the Quadrennial Energy Review. How many of you heard about this? Yeah, so this is a major priority of his. It's, it's a, actually a good example where, uh, as a, when he was an advisor to the president when he was in the private sector, he made this recommendation to what would be himself in the future, which I think is kind of interesting, uh, that we needed to do a, a quadrennial energy review, kind of like we do a quadrennial defense review, with the, the goal really being to help ensure that federal energy policy is appropriately molded to fit the needs of the current environment, especially with all the change that we've had in recent years in the energy area. And there are a number of recommendations that are going to come out of that that the DOE and the rest of the government are going to really act on. Uh, and the first round of this, they're actually going to do, they're going to hit different sectors uh, over the next four years. The first sector they hit was transmission, storage, and distribution across the board. And there are a number of recommendations in the grid space. And each of these is going to have a major follow-up thread uh, in the next months and year to come. Uh, there, are, there are five major areas of recommendations in the grid space that this uh, quadrennial energy review put forward. Uh, the first is that we need to do a national transmission review and assess the barriers to implementation and find ways to break down the barriers to getting transmission out there. The second is that to DOE, for DOE to convene, stakeholders develop a framework and a strategy for energy storage and other emerging forms of grid flexibility to enable more renewables integration. The third is in the, the interesting and controversial area that we're going to jump into of valuation. You know, really accurate characterization and valuation of new services, being an honest broker to pull together folks around that. The fourth is improving grid communications with a major focus on interoperability. 
Again, a lot of activity there, but an opportunity to pull everyone together. And then finally was a recommendation to launch a $3.5 billion 10-year grid modernization initiative at DOE, uh, which is something that I'm proud to tell you we're actually launching uh, right now. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this grid modernization initiative. Again, we were punching below our weight in my view. We have an office of energy efficiency and renewable energy, my office, which is really a lot of behind the meter work traditionally. And we've got this office of electricity with the distribution and transmission side. And then we've got a new office that reports directly to the secretary called the Energy Policy and Strategic Analysis Office that's doing a lot of work in this space as well. So those three offices are now coming together to create a single uh, grid modernization initiative. Uh, we've developed an early draft of, of a framework or a strategic plan that we see over the next 10 years of, the, of where we want to focus that we're going to be convening uh, with stakeholders like you and others over the summer to throw this out as a straw man and get your feedback. I'll describe a little bit more about what's in there. Uh, but also, for the first time, we're getting all of our national laboratory work. About half of DOE's applied research and development funding goes into the national laboratories. We're going to get all the work that we're funding there under one single umbrella. We've done that now. Uh, with six major working groups. And so we have a single set of leaders there that you can engage with transparently to figure out how to work with this somewhat complex and somewhat hard to uh, map out system in the national labs. Uh, and so we're, Carl Imhoff is our director of that at PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Lab. And our uh, deputy director is Brian Hannigan, who many of you may know from EPRI and, and other areas, who's, uh, who's leading our work at NREL. And in August, that leadership is going to flip where Brian Hannigan will actually be leading uh, for the year after that. And so I really encourage you to reach out to those folks. Uh, we've got 14 labs involved. Uh, we have six major thrusts in our grid modernization initiative, devices and integrated testing. The big idea there, we're going to continue to do R&D in advanced components for the grid. But what's new for us is we're going to start really establishing the capability to, do, to develop standards and do standardized testing uh, to really characterize the grid services that any component on the grid can provide and then also develop a components library that is going to be open and accessible that is a standard format where all devices are going to be characterized in a way that can be plug and play into the models that many of you use. Second is the area of sensing and measurements, uh, where we're going to be pushing hard on R&D for low cost sensors, uh, but also really working hard on what, what that strategy needs to look like in terms of the kind of visibility we need to, uh, to control things the way we, we need to get uh, these grid edge technologies onto the grid in a successful way. Third is system operations, power flow and control, which where we're going to really develop new power flow control devices, especially high-end power electronics, uh, look at architecture and control theory and other areas. Um, fourth is design and planning tools. So really working with you to embed into design and planning tools that everyone's using out there on the regula regulator side and other side, the kind of tools that they need to enable grid edge deployment. Fifth out of six is security and resiliency. And a major new thrust that we hadn't been looking at before is really looking at uh, cybersecurity, Internet of Things on the building and device side of things. And then finally is institutional support. So really engaging with you and, and regulators, the private sector, and others to really try to provide uh, some clarity and honest broker analysis that can help us get over some of the barriers I think that we're facing today. And so this is a 10-year game plan, 2015 uh, to 2025. And a big part of this game plan is that we want to have demonstrated at scale the technologies and the practices that, that we need to enable grid edge deployment and high penetration of low carbon power by about 2020. So our vision is to be funding a number of at scale demos uh, in the 2017 timeframe so that those can be complete around uh, 2020 and early 2020s. And so that's, that's the big strategy on that side, is really to invest not only in research and development, the convening, the analysis, the honest broker uh, convening, but also partnerships with you and integrated major demos over the next few years. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to let you in on, uh, you'll be the first to know, is it's uh, traditionally, you know, the Office of Electricity in my office, uh, EERE, a little bit of, uh, hard, hard, found it hard to work together. A little bit of those internal cultural things, which I think we see some of that out in the industry. Sometimes it's reflected in DOE itself. But we've actually been able to pull together through this grid modernization initiative, and for the very first time ever, DOE is going to put out one single laboratory call, which is basically a call for proposals uh, from our National Laboratory uh, Grid Modernization Lab Consortium, uh, that where about half of, somewhere between 75 and $100 million call 
over the next, uh, next month for the end of the summer for, uh, to really start to build out uh, some of the core work at DOE to establish the framework for this 10-year game plan, uh, where about half of that money is going to be topics that are really platform topics that aren't Office of Electricity or ERE topics. They're just core topics that are really important, with the other half being issues and technology development that's more solar-specific or wind-specific or smart grid specific, et cetera. So the, the kind of areas we're looking at in this lab call will be looking at laying some of the foundation for grid architecture elements, valuation, uh, laying a foundation for device characterization and testing, including standards, capabilities for testing, and establishing these component uh, model libraries, uh, establishing a sensing and measurement strategy where the type and number uh, placement of, of sensors we need to achieve what we need to achieve, also uh, funding pioneering partnerships, uh, maybe a, a dozen or so partnerships with regional stakeholders on their hardest problems with our to work with the national labs on. We've already got our national labs working with the New York Rev process, with California, and adding a lot of value. We want to expand that all across the country as well. Uh, and then also, we're going to be investing, uh, so that's going to be about 75 to 100 million that's going to come out over the next uh, few months. Most important, though, is that, that it's going to take industry partners and stakeholder engagement for this to be successful. So what I really need you to do is go out and visit Pacific Northwest National Lab, Carl Imhoff and Brian Hannigan over at NREL, and get to know them, talk to them about what you're doing. Uh, and ideally, you'd be able to partner with them when they propose uh, their lab call to us. They're just going to go through a very rigorous merit review. But it's an opportunity for us to begin to build that relationship that we're going to need if together we're going to really overcome some of the challenges at the grid edge. And so uh, in terms of engagement, again, I encourage you to really get involved with our National Lab Grid Modernization Lab Consortium through PNNL and NREL. And um, I also really want to encourage you to come visit us. Come to DOE. You know, come get to know us. Come help us understand what you're doing. We really want to establish a, a strong partnership here. And then over this summer, I think, is really critical for us because we're going to really kind of establish this uh, multi-year program plan for our grid modernization initiative in a very concrete way by the end of the summer. We're going to be all over the country doing regional engagement. I hope that you can make it to at least one of those. And we're also going to have this significant follow-up to those recommendations from the Quadrennial Energy Review, where each of those recommendations is going to have a significant follow-up thread. And so between that Quadrennial Energy Review and our grid modernization initiative, I think by the end of the summer, uh, we're really going to need your input on that's going to map out a path forward for how we can partner in a very significant way uh, to really enable this grid of the future that, that I think we're all very excited about building together. So uh, great being here. I'm mainly here to get your feedback. It's a great time to engage. We're kind of at step, the first step of, of a long road together. Uh, we're just getting organized in the right way. And so I'm looking forward to having a lot of conversations here and in the future with you to help us really map out the strategy that we can implement together. So thank you very much. Interesting stuff. Thanks so much, David. Um, so yeah, I just have a, a couple questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, uh, you know, given a lot of things you just said, uh, they're very relative uh, to some of the work that we've been doing and on the research side of things. We forecast actually last week that the global market for PV deployment in 2020 will reach about 135 gigawatts, that, with the uh, cumulative at that point being around 700 gigawatts. And to put that in context for folks, that's about the size of all current um, electrical generating capacity in Europe. So in your mind, I mean, are we at that tipping point and do you feel that utilities are um, uh, evolving from, with our grid modernization practices at a similar pace to keep up with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, we see the similar projections, uh, you know, that solar is coming and there are still people out there who, who tell me, so what solar, that's, you know, uh, that's 20 years away. Um, but I think anyone who's in the know knows that it's growing rapidly, uh, and, and it's a very exciting time. Um, you know, we've tried to, there, there's the obvious tension um, between some of the models. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the approach that the Department of Energy is, is really going to take is that we don't want to, we want to see the outcomes, right, uh, regionally. We want to see the greenhouse gas emissions reductions. We want to see the reliability. We want to see the affordability. We want to see the resiliency. And um, what we really want to do is, work with different regional stakeholders to be an honest broker, to bring people together. Um, you know, we, around the net metering debate, which is obviously a, a, a major debate that comes up every time 
um, secretary or myself are out and about talking about the grid. Uh, you know, we, we tried to bring some folks together in a little bit, and I'd say kind of an informal way from different sides of the aisle on that issue. And we, what I felt happened is we didn't get very far because everyone had their own facts. Mm. And so I think that a, a major role that we want to play is, you know, a convening isn't enough. I think we feel that we got to convene and do some honest broker analysis. And our national laboratories, I think, are in a great position. They have a great reputation uh, for, they just answer the questions. They don't, uh, they don't have a bias one way or the other. And so I think we can get the carbon, we can get the resiliency, we can get the reliability, the affordability. We're going to work with any set of stakeholders uh, to try to put facts on the table to keep the conversation moving forward. Um, and that's been, a, I've been surprised to see that that, that role for DOE uh, in our national laboratories has been, it was a non-obvious role for me, but I think it's actually been a productive one. We've got folks from Pacific Northwest National Lab and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab very engaged in the REV process. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, um, you know, they're not pushing in any direction, but when, when a group of folks hit an impasse, they're able to go back and do some really good modeling and analysis, or even sometimes just uh, use their ability to distill the complex into the understandable to actually get over hurdles and move forward. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, yeah, let's, o let's open it up to the audience. You know, we have a few minutes left, so I'd really let, uh, like to have you, you folks uh, get the opportunity to ask David a couple questions. We've got one in the middle here. We have a mic coming around, um, so we'll get to you. Yeah, right back there in the uh, middle. Well, she, you'll, go, you'll go second. She's got a mic now, so you can, yeah, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I had some questions for you in regards to what DOE is doing for projects over on some of our American territories or islands where they really do have major issues with the cost per kilowatt. They've got issues with outages. They've got real issues with reliability. Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. And these are great opportunities. You know, we've had a, uh, Hawaii is not one of those, but we've had a long-term relationship between DOE and Hawaii, Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative that has, you know, again, help them when they hit a barrier, we try to help them overcome it, whether it's a, an analysis barrier, a, a technology barrier, a convening barrier. Uh, I mentioned the, um, the work with NREL and Solar City as an example of that, which has allowed Hawaii to be confident to make the goal of 100% renewables, which is pretty impressive. But in particular, um, you mentioned the US Virgin Islands is an area where we've had a partnership for the last few years. And again, I've been, uh, it didn't take a lot of investment from DOE. Uh, I, we actually funded one full-time, I think maybe even part-time person from NREL to go and be an honest broker, to, to, to just be there at the table when the different stakeholders were, were sitting around trying to figure out what to do. It's a great first market for the grid edge for distributed energy technology because, as you said, I think they're paying you know, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, the U.S. Virgin Islands, people on islands are sometimes willing to tolerate, I got to be with the, the head of the utility there, they're willing to tolerate lower reliability too. So it's actually a really good first market uh, for some of this stuff. And um, I have a lot of interest. And I'm interested in putting funds into expanding what I think was very successful in USVI. They've re reduced their, uh, their oil usage by 30, 40% already. They've installed a lot of solar. Uh, they've moved from uh, diesel fuel to natural gas liquids that they can import from the US. So they're getting off some of the Venezuelan dependence as well. Uh, so I have a lot of interest. I think there's a lot of strategic interest in the Caribbean in particular. Uh, so that's an area I think we, we could very cost effectively scale that impact. Again, it's, it's funding a, a convener and expert who can then overcome barriers and, and go back to the mothership and bring the capabilities to the table to keep the ball moving forward for, for, uh, for stakeholders like this. Excellent. And uh, got one back here. My question is, uh, to what extent do you interface with state regulatory bodies and investor-owned utilities to help encourage uh, redesign of, or of the pricing models or uh, the incentive programs at all levels? And then also, uh, what's your view on uh, the, the uh, trend I'm hearing about uh, f foreign manufacturers of panels wanting to establish plants in the U.S. And, there are any incentives for them to produce products in the U.S.? Um, so on the first side, you know, the Office of Electricity, um, which is, again, my sister organization, has had a long-term relationship in funding technical assistance with the states on the issues that you're talking about. 
Um, but we're really looking to step up our game as, as a whole at DOE. Uh, the Quadrennial Energy Review made the strong recommendation. Our grid modernization initiative is, is really building up the capability and the capacity. The institutional support is a, is a critical part of our strategy. And so um, we're looking to, to step up the game there. Again, we're hoping to establish on the order of 10 new major regional partnerships uh, just in the near future to begin to build those relationships, solve, solve some hard problems that are of relevance, uh, and actually start to do some of the, again, honest broker analysis to run the numbers about what kind of operational modes, what kind of pricing schemes are gonna allow for that, you know, as clean as we can get, where we need to get, while achieving affordability, reliability, resiliency. And on the, was it on solar manufacturing that you were interested in, or was it? Uh, you know, generally, the, the, if you look at most policy in the federal government, the, the, the government likes it when anyone comes and manufactures in the United States. Um, but we also want to see people operating a, in a fair way from a trade perspective, uh, which is why Department of Commerce and others have made some determinations there. And actually, my office does the fundamental analysis that goes to commerce to, where they make their decisions related to uh, trade issues. Um, but generally speaking, I think we're, we're happy to see reshoring of manufacturing. We're excited to see uh, Salevo Solar City make a huge announcement in, uh, to manufacture in upstate New York. You know, Suniva is scaling in Michigan. And so I think we're seeing, as the market's growing here, uh, we're seeing, and I think the quality of domestically produced modules is recognized. We, we put together a program at NREL qual called uh, Qualification Plus to make sure that it was being recognized if, if modules are actually more reliable or, or having uh, less degradation over time. And so um, I actually think we're pretty optimistic about where solar manufacturing is going uh, in general. Great. Other questions out there? Okay. Dave, thanks for your talk. Uh, Roger Weed with One Energy Systems. And two questions about your presentation. One is the grid modernization effort that you initiative you described. Is that dependent on funding that's not currently approved yet by Congress or not? And secondly, do you see the things you're talking about as places for small companies and startups to engage, or do you think it's mainly a, an activity for larger organizations that have more resources? Yeah, well, I spent a lot of my time on the funding issue uh, up on Capitol Hill, and uh, you know, we, if you look across all of DOE for fiscal year 16, which would start in October, we asked for about 300 and I think it was 356 million in one year for this initiative. Uh, when I look at where the House and Senate marks. Are, are sitting, I would predict we'd get about half that, which I think is still a, a really strong uh, investment portfolio. And I would expect to get about half of that, you know, so let's say that's one, one, 150, 180. Uh, half of that would go out competitively through open funding opportunities uh, in key areas. And then half of that would go into the national laboratories, which again, would be places that companies could come in and find partnerships where you would, you would have a funded partnership uh, with the national lab potentially. And so, um, when it comes to partnerships, my main advice is to just go, uh, go meet with the folks in the labs uh, and, and try to craft um, high impact collaborations that you could do with them. Um, very soon we'll be putting, you know, through stakeholder engagement process I mentioned, we're going to be putting out a straw man multi-year program plan that really shows the areas that we're interested in investing in together. Um, and so we'll get feedback on that, but I think that draft plan will be what we're going to work from. So we'll be putting that out publicly very soon for comment. Uh, so that'll be a great opportunity to look at, but also just go hustle and pound the pavement to get to know the folks in the national laboratories. And also, um, you know, when I, was at, when I was in the private sector, I thought the way that the government behaved, I thought they didn't want to see me. They didn't want me anywhere near them because it's just don't, they're not very user friendly. You don't have emails on the web, those kind of things. But people at the department really want to meet with people. So, you know, if you send me an email or, or anyone from DOE, you're going to, if you come to DC, you're going to get a meeting. So I really encourage you to build those relationships to kind of co-inform each other what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do. Uh, and what I would say is small businesses are, are as, as likely as a big business to, to get uh, funding from us. Uh, one last thing I wanted to mention is that um, very soon we'll be announcing the availability of about $20 million dollars. Uh, that's available for small business vouchers, probably about 100 small business vouchers uh, that will be funding about, let's say, 100, 200K that can go into the lab 
on your most important problem. And so I think very soon we'll be announcing the laboratories that are going to be running that program. But that's a great opportunity, I, I think, for a small business uh, to, to get involved. Excellent. Probably have time for uh, one, one last question. Hi, Secretary Danielson. My name is Barbara Lockwood. I'm with Arizona Public Service Company. And as you probably know, Arizona is ground zero for <laughs> the discussions around pricing and net energy metering. So we are obviously looking with great interest at what DOE is uh, intending to do uh, in that realm. And it seems to be a little outside of traditional um, valuation processes, the pricing uh, process in particular that DOE has focused on. So my question is, what sort of reaction have you gotten from the state regulators, which is typically their purview to take a look at these sorts of issues and make determinations in that regard? Yeah, you know what? We're going we're gonna to be respectful of, of the stakeholders uh, while still making sure that we're answering, put, you know, putting forward a fundamental, honest broker, fact-based analysis around these issues. Um, I think that, so we, we have had a couple of, of smaller workshops around the approaches that we're thinking about, and we'll be getting this document out more broadly. We wanted to have something that we could put together that people could react to. And by the way, nothing's in stone right now in any way, shape, or form. We're just at the beginning of our process. Um, and I think we, we started seeing folks with their shoulders pretty high, and by the time that we kind of finished our conversation about what we're trying to do, people were feeling a, a little bit more um, comfortable with the situation. You know, what I would encourage you uh, and others to do is, is let, get in the game with us, uh, you know, join our workshops this summer. We're gonna have a lot of convening. Uh, I think you're gonna find that we're gonna be very rational. We're not meaning to throw things one way or the other. Um, I'd really encourage you to, to come and work with our national laboratories as well. Um, and we know that these problems are sticky and, I, and we know that it's really the state regulators that, that, uh, that are gonna have the lead here. But we're going to work in hand in hand with the regulators to just help them answer the questions where they feel they want some clarity and some honest broker information. Well, great. We're about out of time, and we've got to get on to our next session. Uh, David, thank you so much for great. being here, and uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thanks.